So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Gravlin, and I am the Library Consultant for Inclusive Services and the Director of the ABLE Library. Um, I started my position with the Vermont Department of Libraries in July, and so I'm happy to be meeting a lot of you for the first time today. So welcome and thank you for being here. Um, today we're going to be talking about rural literacy and public libraries. Before we get started, I just want to share that I'm not a literacy expert. I'm a librarian. So like many of you, my area of expertise is connecting people with information and resources. And that's my goal today, to provide you all with um, information, resources, and support so that you can um, address literacy issues in ways that work best for your libraries and communities. If you have any questions as I'm talking about literacy, please feel free to stop me at any time to ask them, um, but there will also, there'll also be time at the end um, for questions and discussion. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. So what is literacy? There are so many different types of literacy that we talk about today, from digital literacy, financial literacy, to media literacy. Um, and these are all very important skills for people to have, but today I'm focusing on a specific definition of literacy. Um, I'm giving you this definition so that we're all on the same page while we talk about this. Um, <clears throat> so literacy, as defined by the National Center for Education Statistics, is the ability to use printed and written information to function in society, to achieve one's goals, and to develop one's knowledge and potential. I appreciate this definition because it goes beyond just being able to read. I think it's important to acknowledge that it isn't the act of reading itself that's necessarily meaningful to people, unless you're a bookworm like me, as I suspect many of you are. Uh, but really, it's all of the things that are possible when we know how to read. It's an essential skill that serves as the foundation, <clears throat> excuse me, for many of the activities we engage in at work, at home, and in our, in a, <clears throat> in our leisure time. And I don't think that it's enough to just get by when it comes to literacy. Yes, it's important for people to be able to read and fill out forms, but that level of skill only ensures that people have the bare minimum to survive. When people are literacy proficient, so many more opportunities are opened up to them and to their families and communities. So before we talk about what libraries in rural areas can do to address literacy issues. I think it's critical for us to understand what the literacy needs in the country as well as Vermont look like from a broad perspective. So when we look at childhood literacy in the US, around 34% of children entering kindergarten lack basic skills that lead to literacy or what we call early literacy skills. These skills include uh, print, print motivation, print awareness, vocabulary, narrative skills, letter knowledge, and phonological awareness. That means that these children are already behind 66% of their peers before they've even begun. It also means that teachers have to work that much harder to get these students up to the same level as their classmates. And by the time children reach fourth grade, 65% of them are reading below their grade level. It's interesting because fourth grade seems to be um, what the magic number when we're talking about childhood literacy. It's considered a watershed year in that if a student is not reading proficiently by fourth grade, they have a 78% chance of never catching up. And when they graduate from high school, only 37% of students are at or above reading proficiency. And we'll talk more about what this means um, for their life outcomes later in the presentation. So unfortunately, we see these numbers play out when we look at literacy levels across for adults in the US. Um, according to the National Center Education for Statistics, 48% of adults read at level three literacy or above. So adults at level three and above are considered fully literate. They're able to evaluate sources as well as infer sophisticated meaning and complex ideas from written sources. Another 33% of adults in the US are at level two literacy. So adults at level two can read well enough to evaluate product reviews and perform other tasks that require comparisons and simple conclusions, but they're unlikely to correctly evaluate the reliability of sources or draw sophisticated conclusions. And another 19% of adults across the US are at or below level one literacy. So adults at or below level one may struggle to understand texts 
beyond filling out basic forms, and they find it difficult to make inferences from written material. So in other words, they would have a hard time reading a passage and using the information presented in that passage to draw a conclusion. So what does literacy look like in Vermont? Fortunately, Vermont's literacy rates are better than the rest of the nation's. In fact, the numbers are better across the board for both children and adults. However, as we just saw, national literacy rates are not acceptable, so I think there's room for us to continue to improve. So here in Vermont, some of the statistics surrounding childhood literacy um, were difficult for me to find. So I looked at the Vermont Agency of Education to see if they had any statistics on children's early literacy rates um, when they're entering kindergarten. So when we're looking at students entering kindergarten, we know that 17% of Vermont students are not kindergarten ready. The Agency of Education uses they're ready, that's their ready for kindergarten survey, which assesses the readiness of children entering kindergarten <clears throat> based on students' knowledge and skills within the first six to 10 weeks of school. So Vermont's concept of children's readiness includes more than early literacy skills. They also look at things like social and emotional competence among others, but it does give us some indication as to a student's readiness to read. Let's see. Also here in Vermont, <clears throat> excuse me, 57% of students in fourth grade read below their grade level. And remember that fourth grade is that watershed year, so these students have a 78% chance of never catching up. And finally, I'm, I'm guesstimating that between 40 to 50% of Vermont's high school graduates are at or above reading proficiency. So again, this was a, just a statistic that I had a hard time finding for Vermont but our literacy statistics are on par with other states in New England, which report anywhere from 43% to 50% of 12th graders graduating at or above reading proficiency. So I think it's safe to say that Vermont's 12th graders follow a similar trend. Again, adult literacy levels in Vermont are better than the country's, but I think you'll see that there are still efforts to be made to improve literacy levels within the state. So 54% of adults in Vermont are at or above level three literacy. Um, as I mentioned before, these folks are considered fully literate and can evaluate sources and draw knowledgeable conclusions from reading materials. And 33% of adults in Vermont are at level two literacy. So again, adults at level two can evaluate written materials, make comparisons and draw simple conclusions based on what they've read. And 13% of adults in Vermont are at or below level one literacy. So folks at or below level one may have difficulty filling out basic forms and find it challenging to draw conclusions based on what they've read. And as an additional statistic, here in Vermont as of 2018, nearly 42,000 Vermonters have not graduated from high school, um, 12,000 of whom have not completed ninth grade. So while it's true that we, we have a low high school dropout rate, which is fantastic. There's still a large number of people in Vermont who never completed high school. And while adult literacy is important in its own right, it plays a huge factor in generational illiteracy. The National Bureau of Economic Research says 72% of children whose parents have low literacy skills will likely be at the lowest reading levels themselves. So according to the American Library Association, a child who is a poor reader at the end of first grade has a 90% chance of still being a poor reader at the end of fourth grade. So why does any of this matter to us in our communities? A lot of people look at the inability to read as a personal failing that doesn't affect anyone but the person who can't read. And unfortunately, that's far from the truth. As I mentioned, as I just mentioned, adults' literacy skills directly affect their children's literacy skills. And I'm gonna share some statistics with you that highlight how low literacy affects children throughout their lives. But first, I'd like to share some of the predictors of low literacy skills in children. So as I mentioned, if a child's parents have low literacy skills, that child is 72% more likely to be at a low reading level in school. In fact, researchers funded by the National Institutes of Health found that a mother's reading skill is the greatest determinant of her child's future academic, academic success. And that outweighs other factors such as neighborhood and family income, which I thought was just, that just kind of blew my mind. Um, poverty plays a large role in whether children develop literacy skills during their early years as well. 
When parents are struggling to secure food and housing for their families, they are far less likely to be engaged in building early literacy skills with their children. What are some of the impacts of early literacy? We know that children's brains are rapidly developing in the first few years of life, and this, de um, <clears throat> this development makes it especially important to expose young children to reading. By the age of two, children who are read to regularly display greater language comprehension, larger vocabularies, and higher cognitive skills than their peers. And additionally, children who are read to at least three times a week by a family member are almost twice as likely to score in the top 25% of reading compared to children who are read to less than three times a week. So what happens in school? According to the Children's Reading Foundation, two out of every 10 children enter kindergarten with skills two to three years lower than their grade level, and another two out of 10 children start school with a one-year disadvantage. When they're in school, kids only make about one year's worth of improvement in reading skills per school year, which makes sense. So they're consistently behind the rest of their classmates throughout their academic career. What are the outcomes for children with low literacy skills? As I mentioned previously, fourth grade is that watershed year so that um, if kids are not reading by at grade level by fourth grade, they have a 78% chance of never catching up. In fact, they are four, more, four times more likely to drop out of high school than children reading at grade level in fourth grade. If that's not enough, on a personal financial level, high school dropouts can expect to earn an annual income of just $20,241 a year, which is over $10,000 less than what a high school graduate earns. So when we think back to those 42,000 Vermonters who didn't graduate from high school, they're potentially losing more than $420 million a year that they would have earned if they had graduated from high school. From a taxpayer perspective, high school dropouts cost taxpayers an average of $292,000 over a lifetime due to the cost of incarceration and other factors like how much less they pay in taxes. Additionally, research has shown that roughly 78% of juvenile crime is committed by high school dropouts and 85% of children who interface with the juvenile court system are functionally illiterate. Unfortunately, the impacts of low literacy on adults are equally distressing. So I'm sorry, this is this part is the kind of the downer. I promise that it gets it gets better later in the presentation. Um, but one aspect that always catches people's attention when it comes to literacy are the economic impacts. So people at level three literacy make on average 13,000 more a year than those at level two. People at level three literacy make on average almost $24,000 more a year than those at level one. Um, all told, the nation could be losing up to $2.2 trillion annually due to low literacy rates. And this number is calculated based on the wages people would be earning if they were literacy proficient, the taxes they would be paying on those higher wages, as well as lost productivity and wages, since adults with low literacy skills are more likely to be incarcerated or unemployed. There are also several civic and social impacts of adult low literacy levels. So um, a low literacy level makes it more difficult to understand civic issues and lowers an individual's level of community involvement and civic participation. And this can have long lasting impacts on the health and well-being of a community. Everyone should have the ability and opportunity to participate in our civic life because a healthy democracy depends on citizen participation. The US Department of Justice reports that 75% of state prison inmates are either classified as low literate or high school dropouts. The Literacy Project Foundation reported that three out of five people in prison can't read. Individuals with low levels of literacy are more likely to experience poorer employment opportunities and outcomes and lower income. As a result, they often face welfare dependency and higher levels of crime. Furthermore, people with low, a low level of literacy have limited ability to make important informed decisions in everyday life and struggle with tasks such as filling out forms and applications, understanding government policies, and reading medicine or nutritional labels. Um, the repercussions of literacy on health cannot be understated. Studies have found that people with low levels of literacy are more likely to experience adverse health outcomes, have poor health literacy, and practice poor health behaviors. For example, people with low levels of health literacy are more likely to experience higher hospital admission rates, 
a lack of engagement with health services such as cancer screening, and a lack of understanding and adherence to medical advice. Unfortunately, the recent COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the extent of the lack of health literacy across the country. So during the pandemic, we saw that many people found it difficult to understand and apply the information provided by health professionals in the government. The pandemic highlighted that adequate literacy and health literacy are important in ensuring that people can understand and correctly apply health information to prevent disease, and the failure to do so increases the risk for disease transmission. The end result is literacy is about so much more than not being able to read. It affects people's health, economic stability, and ability to participate in and contribute to our communities. Um, so with that, I'd like to play a short TED Talk for you um, by John Trichetti. He's a librarian himself, and um, he goes over the importance of literacy just to kind of drive home some of the things that I've been discussing, and also so that you don't have to listen to me talk for so long and kind of break it up a little bit. So I'm going to see. Let's see if I can get my PowerPoint back here. So now that we have an understanding of why literacy is so important, we should also recognize the fact that, that the challenges to addressing literacy issues in rural areas are unique. Children in rural areas face some challenges that children in urban areas don't. So according to the Economic Research Service at the USDA, in 2018, 22.4% of students in non-metro schools were in poverty compared with their metro school counterparts at 17.3%. Um, Save the Children reports that here in Vermont, 18.1% of children living in rural areas live in poverty, as opposed to 8.8% of Vermont children living in urban areas. As previously discussed, poverty plays a role in determining a child's literacy level. So if rural children are more likely to live in poverty, then they're also more likely to experience literacy challenges. And in 2015, 15.7% uh, of children in Vermont living in rural areas experienced food insecurity. Even though this statistic isn't directly related to literacy, I think it speaks to the more immediate concerns of children and their families and how that might be prioritized over reading and learning. And due to socioeconomic circumstances and the absence of financial flexibility in rural dis school districts, some children in rural areas lack consistent access to quality early reading opportunities. For example, school districts may not have the time or funding to establish beneficial relationships with places like po local public libraries that would enable and encourage families and students to take advantage of those resources, especially at the preschool level. Adults in rural communities also face, face unique challenges. What keeps someone in a rural community from seeking help? Uh, many of the answers are the same for anyone in any community who's struggling with literacy, but I wanted to mention a few that are unique or more pronounced when living in a rural area. The first is shame. So people are embarrassed to admit that they have difficulty reading, and I'm sure it's probably a pretty common feeling no matter where you live. But when you're living in a small community where everyone knows each other, it can be especially difficult because it's much harder to remain anonymous. People also don't realize how prevalent illiteracy or low literacy is, and they're probably not the only ones in their community who are struggling with this. But when you're embarrassed to talk about it, it's not easy to connect with others who are also dealing with low literacy, and it's not easy to, to connect with resources to help you overcome it. Another um, challenge is library access. Patrons may have a hard time getting to the library. So we're fortunate that here in Vermont, we have a very large number of libraries and rural communities are no exception, but accessing those libraries can be difficult. Either the hours the library is open aren't convenient, patrons don't have transportation, or they live far enough away that it's a challenge to get to the library on a regular basis. This means there are fewer books at home for children and adults, which as we saw in the video, is a significant predictor of literacy success. And some rural communities lack the resources to address literacy issues. There may not be the funding to keep the library open longer or staffed adequately to provide programming. There may be a lack of organizations that can get out to a rural community to work on issues like literacy. There may be a lack of public transportation in rural communities that contribute to a library being inaccessible for some community members. 
There are many reasons why an individual might decide not to address their low literacy, and it bears keeping in mind when you're thinking about how to provide services to people who may be reluctant to take advantage of them, even if they desperately need those services. While there are certainly some unique challenges facing individuals in rural areas, the challenges don't stop there. I'm sure you're all acutely aware of the obstacles rural libraries face. The following are just a few that I've identified for us to think about in the context of um, any literacy initiatives you might be considering. So the first challenge is that there is no one size fits all approach. Rural communities are not the same, the resources they have are not the same, and the needs they have are not the same. And this is just one of many reasons why it has been so difficult to address literacy needs in rural communities. There's no one program or solution that's going to work in all communities. This is also why local public libraries can be so important. You're the experts in your communities. You know their needs and you know what resources you have and what you're lacking. Isolation is another challenge. It's often difficult to find support because you have a small staff or you're working alone. In a small community, you might be the only person talking about literacy, let alone trying to provide resources towards increasing literacy rates. In more urban areas, there may be multiple libraries and partner organizations that can work together to provide services around literacy, which just isn't as feasible in a rural community. How do you learn about new resources and ideas, collaborate and stay motivated when you're often working alone? And another challenge is a lack of resources. Small communities, they have less resources to put towards literacy initiatives. Um, they have smaller budgets and a little has to go a long way. Libraries may not have the financial support to do more than provide basic library services. And many librarians are only working part time. And the time that they are working is dedicated to providing those basic library services. And there are fewer supporting organizations within small communities that you can partner with. So what can rural libraries do? My first suggestion is to research demographics in your area if, if that's possible for you. So look at census data. Even though you probably have a good idea of who's living in your community, it can't hurt to take a look at census data and either confirm what you know or learn something new about your community and who lives there. Are you not seeing or reaching certain demographics within your community? For example, are there significantly more children in your community than have library cards? Another great resource is the Barbara Bush Foundation, which has a literacy gap map, and I'll provide the link for that at the end of this presentation. But that map shows literacy rates by county, so you can get a pretty good idea of what your community's literacy rates look like. You can also take a look at state um, and or municipal economic reports. Since we know that poverty and low literacy are linked, this is another good indicator of what's happening in, in your community. And also, um, talk to your local, industries and businesses because um, they might have a unique perspective on you know what kind of educational needs are they seeing are residents in your area workforce ready if people in your community travel outside of your of your town um, to work you might end up reaching out to businesses in other towns nearby um, just to get that information the next step is to decide what resources you're willing and able to dedicate to improving literacy. Um, how much time can you allot to a literacy program? What space does your library have to accommodate a program? Do you have public computers that can be used or a meeting room space for classes? And how much money, if any, do you have to allocate to, to a literacy program to purchase study materials or train volunteers? And finally, find out about resources in the community that can help. Um, Participants um, of any literacy program might need child care. Um, they might not be able to attend a, liter a literacy program unless they can find child care. Um, they might need transportation. Again, think about how easy or difficult it is for the demographic you're trying to reach to get to the library. Um, Community resources can also be outside sources of funding. Can other organizations in your community partner with you um, to provide funding for things like that childcare or that transportation? Or do they have volunteers who are willing to help? So once you've done your initial research and have an idea of what the literacy needs look like in your community and what kind of resources you have to dedicate to a literacy program, you can start to think about the kind of program that makes sense for your library and your community. So if you've determined that the biggest need in your community involves children's literacy, there are a few things you can do depending on your capacity. 
Um, so some of you might know about Every Child Ready to Read. It's a parent education initiative that's sponsored by the Public Library Association and the Association for Library Service to Children. It provides curriculum and materials for libraries and educa to educate parents and caregivers about in the importance of early literacy and how to nurture pre-reading skills at home. Kind of piggybacking on that is um, Web Junction offers a free self-paced course on supercharged story times, which focus on intentionally including early literacy content in story times that can increase children's later readiness to read. So when you're thinking about story times, there are a lot of components that we just do instinctively because it makes sense or because we've always done it that way. For example, singing. Why do we sing in story time? As it turns out, singing is one of the practices of early literacy. So it's just about understanding that and intentionally creating story times that are based on what we know about early literacy. So skills taught in the course include incorporating early literacy components that are key to learning and engaging parents and caregivers in, er in early literacy. As noted in the earlier video, children in low-income households have access to far fewer books than children in higher-income households. So the takeaway was to get books into the hands of children. You could try offering deposit collections to local daycares, signing up children for library cards when they enroll in school, or find other ways to get into the community and get books to children. Maybe instead of a huge summer reading prize at the end of the summer, you decide to give every child who registers for summer reading a free book. There are other organizations like the Dolly Parton Imagination Library that might be able to partner with you to provide books to kids as well. And finally, partner with school librarians. School libraries are often invaluable partners and sometimes face more challenging budgets than public libraries. Find ways to partner and provide support. Have them bring the kids to the library as a field trip or offer to bring a program to the school. I worked at a library where we would send out library card applications before the kids came on their field trip and the school would send us the filled out applications before their field trip. We would make the cards prior to their arrival. And then during the field trip, the kids were able to pick up their cards and check out books at the same time. So maybe you and the school librarian allow kids to return public library books to the school and vice versa to help improve access. In short, our goals are the same and it only makes sense to find ways to work together. If, on the other hand, you determine that your community needs lean more towards adult literacy, you have a few options as well, depending on your capacity. And that's important. I want to stress that all of these options are just suggestions. Even just knowing that these options are available for when you do have the time or being able to direct a, a patron to helpful resources is great. Librarians are often already stretched well past acceptable levels of workloads, so I don't want anyone to feel that they have to act now or that they have to run a huge program. That's why I've kind of tiered these next suggestions based on capacity. These suggestions start out with minimal resources needed and then gradually increase in the library's investment of time and resources. So at a very basic level, your library can be an information center about adult education opportunities, resources, and referrals. In other words, you can create a permanent display or space dedicated to adult literacy. If you do this, um, make sure your display is prominent, current, and fresh. Check on a regular basis for updates, new flyers, etc. You'll also want to change the look of your display every so often so that it remains attractive to patrons and catches people's attention when they walk in. Staff should be prepared to answer questions from your patrons, so instead of redirecting them to the display, staff should be able to answer basic questions and have some knowledge of the resources you're promoting to your patrons. And then if you wanted to have an event or program, you could organize a yearly informational fair and invite some of the organizations you've been promoting to attend and get a chance to provide more in-depth information to your patrons. If you've identified that you have more resources you can dedicate, your library can be an education, adult education and GED support center. So in addition to a permanent display, you could provide some of the material students would use when learning to read or studying for the GED. There are all sorts of study materials available that you can include in your library collections. You can provide other, you can provide other resources like a News for You subscription, which is a newspaper geared towards adult learners. I've seen it used in literacy efforts as well as English language learning programs. At the next level, your library can be a GED online test practice center. So in addition to providing study materials, you would provide access to online practice tests. And if you have public computers, you would set aside reserve time on them for studying. Um, for students who are studying for the GED. 
you can the next level requires um, a lot more resources and time on the part of libraries and librarians, but you can be a literacy or adult education instructional center. Um, in this case, you would provide classes to students, perhaps in partnership with another organization. And this would involve determining the specific needs of your patrons. Are you going to offer a basic adult literacy program where students lack basic literacy skills and the library program teaches them to read? Are you going to offer a basic adult education program where students have some literacy skills but need improvement in reading and math? Are you going to offer uh, a pre-GED or a GED prep program where the library provides high school level classes to pass the GED? So those are all things that you're going to want to consider um, when you're looking at the needs of your community. And then you can craft a program that targets those specific needs. But if there's an organization in your community that's already addressing literacy or adult educational needs, you don't need to duplicate efforts. So in that case, your library can promote the work of that organization and serve as a post-GED career and continu continuing education support center. So you provide job search assistance and continuing education opportunities to your patrons. Again, these are all just suggestions. Maybe one of these ideas sounds like it would work for your library. Maybe you end up doing a combination of things. You might decide to try out supercharged story times and an information display for adults. You can mix and match any of these into something that works for your library and your patrons. The good news is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. As I said in the beginning of this presentation, I'm not a literacy expert and you don't have to be either. I think as librarians, we tend to try to be everything to everyone because we want to make sure that our patrons have the information and resources they need. But there are existing organizations that you can connect with to help you create a program that works for your patrons. And I encourage you to reach out to them and find ways you can partner. I know I mentioned that rural areas may not have some of the organizations within their communities that can help address literacy issues, but I think that that's where libraries can really shine and bring in those organizations and give them a way into the community. So we have um, Vermont Adult Learning, which helps adult learners ages 16 and older, and they do reading, writing, math, and computer skills. They help with earning high school diplomas or GEDs, and their services are available in person and online. Um, Central Vermont Adult Basic Education, they offer instruction and learning basic skills like reading, writing, math, and computer literacy. Um, they do English language that prepares students for US citizenship. They also provide high school uh, diplomas and GED programs and help with college and career readiness. Northeast Kingdom Learning Services offers adult education and literacy programs, and they provide math, reading, and writing skill development, job skill development, um, and they support students' transition to work or college, and many of their services are avail available virtually as well. The Tutorial Center offers assistance in acquiring a high school diploma or GED. They work with um, reading and math skills, workforce, de workforce development, and career planning. On the children's side, the Children's Literacy Foundation, um, they work to inspire read, love of reading and writing for children um, up to age 12 who are low income at risk or rural children. And they work both in New Hampshire and Vermont. And finally, there's the um, Vermont Humanities Council. They offer a professional, a professional development program called Never Too Early, and that's for early care and education providers and read with me programs for parents of children from birth to age six. So again, these are just some of the organizations that are already working on literacy here in Vermont that you can partner with. It may be that they can come in and train a volunteer you've identified to run a literacy program at the library. Or maybe you offer library space and marketing and they offer a literacy or adult education program. It could be um, that you and two or three other libraries get together and partner with one of these organizations to come up with a program that works for all of your communities. Um, but the takeaway is that it doesn't have to fall only on your shoulders. Um, there are partners out there who can help. So um, while literacy focused organizations seem like a natural partner in any program you're considering for literacy, I think it's also worth looking at other possible partners in your communities. You could try working with your local church. There may be, they may be able to provide assistance with childcare or transportation needs that I mentioned earlier. They may also be able to help raise money or awareness. And if you don't have space at your library for a class, your local church may be able to provide that. And they might also have volunteers as well. 
Um, service clubs like Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis, Junior League, those are all other great partners to pursue. Again, they have access to volunteers and can help raise funds or awareness about your literacy program. Local businesses can be great partners as well. Some might be interested in providing a monetary donation. For instance, you could solicit donations towards a summer reading program where that money goes towards purchasing a book for every child. It's good publicity for them and it helps strengthen their community. Um, other nonprofits within your community may be able to provide volunteers, resources, or help you raise awareness about your program. National nonprofits may also be valuable partners. Earlier, I mentioned the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. That organization sends books to registered children from birth to five years old in the mail every month for free, and they get to keep them. Uh, but that particular program would require some financial commitment. But again, it's just one example of how a national organization can be utilized to increase literacy in your community. Um, there are some things to consider. Um, there are some other things that we should be considering. What I'm going to share with you is not an exhaustive list, but hopefully it just offers some different perspectives when it comes to literacy that you may or may not have considered. So this doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have to address every single special case, but it is helpful to keep in mind that there are many reasons why someone may lack literacy skills. And just as there is no one size fits all approach that works for every community, you may run into situations where certain people you're trying to reach with literacy efforts may not respond as well to those efforts as others. Um, so the first group is English language learners. This population may have very different needs than a native English speaker who lacks literacy skills. Not only are they learning English, but they're also learning to read, which can be very challenging. Um, different types of classes or study materials may be necessary if you're considering services to this demographic. Patrons who are blind. Um, people who are born blind may or may not have learned to read Braille. If not, then they're considered illiterate because they can't read for themselves. There are organizations that can help, specifically the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired comes to mind. They have programs where they teach people how to read Braille and they serve both children and adults. People who are born deaf may be English language learners if they learned American Sign Language as their first language. They'll most likely need to translate the written word to its ASL equivalent when they're reading, which can slow learners down and be very challenging. Learning disabilities can also present a unique challenge to literacy, and they aren't always readily apparent. For some adults, undiagnosed learning disabilities are what prevented them from learning to read in the first place. So these learners may also require different resources in order to be successful. Again, this list by, is by no means exhaustive. It's just meant as a reminder that there are many factors that contribute to a literacy need, and they aren't always what you would first think of. So I would just encourage you to keep in mind to keep these in mind and avoid making assumptions about why or how a person is struggling with literacy skills. So while doing research for this presentation, I came ac across the Barbara Bush Foundation, which is a national organization that focuses on literacy efforts. One of the things that really stuck with me was a quote from the president and CEO of the Barbara Bush Foundation, who said, low literacy prevents millions of Americans from fully participating in our society and our economy as parents, workers, and citizens. It lies at the core of multi-generational cycles of poverty, poor health, and low educational attainment, contributing to the enormous equity gap that exists in our country. Investing in literacy is absolutely critical to the strength of our nation now and for generations to come. It proves that what Barbara Bush said more than 30 years ago is still true today. Literacy is everyone's business, period. So again, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I hope that some of the information that I gave you was helpful um, and that you feel better prepared to address literacy issues in your community. Does anyone have any questions or does anyone have a literacy program they're currently running that they wanna share with the group? And I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And I'll also go ahead and I just shared in the chat. Um, oops, no, that's the wrong thing. 
So I wanted to share the literacy gap maps that the Barbara Bush Foundation has so that you can see what literacy looks like in your community. have any questions or um, want to talk more about literacy or want to look at any of the resources that I had, I'm going to go ahead and put my email in the chat as well. Um, so feel free to send me an email and I can, I'll send you the presentation. I can send you my resources or answer any questions. Feel free to write questions or comments in the chat as well. This is an unusually quiet group today. <laughs> well, thank you, Jennifer. I feel like I just like a whole wall of information. <laughs> Yeah, but it was a fantastic quality. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and Susan shared in the chat um, some early literacy story time templates, if anyone's interested. Oh no, John, yeah, I, I can't hear you at all. Um, Patty's asking if VitLib has templates for some possible literacy programs that small rural libraries may be able to use. Jonathan, do you know if there's anything, if there are any resources like that available? Um, I don't have any offhand, um, but I can, um, there are definitely ones that exist. Um, I don't know that we have any on the website currently, which also um, we are in the in the works of um, we need to update our, the view services web page as well and add some resources there. But I can see what I can find. Thank you. 